All right, so now let's take a direct run at the last test case for MP1. So at this point, you know, don't proceed unless everything else is working. We're also going to talk about a style of uh, development that's known as test-driven development, where you really drive your development process starting from a test suite and responding to the deficiencies that that test suite uncovers. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little bit about how I work on a, uh, might work on a project like this, right? So uh, we've actually done some of the hard work for you in the sense that we've written the test suites. Uh, frequently when I find a bug in one of my systems, like the playground backend, for example, I fixed a bug earlier this week. You know, I identify what the bug was, I wrote a test case for the bug, and then I ran the test case and it failed. And then I went back to the code, wrote some code, made some changes, went back to the test case, uh, and it failed again, and then I kept doing that until the test case succeeded. Now, I also have a much bigger test suite, and usually I'll run that test suite when I start to make sure that everything's still working. Then I zero in, work on a test case until it passes, and then zoom out to make sure everything is still working because then I know I didn't break anything else. Sometimes in the process of fixing one bug, you end up introducing other bugs that break things that were working before, and so you want to know that. So the first thing I'm going to suggest that you do at this point, and I, I would do this if I was sitting down to start on MP1, um, at even, even having finished the earlier checkpoints, is just confirm that things are working the way that you think they should. And so to do that, I'm going to run the whole MP1 test suite. Now, this is the only time I'm going to do this until I'm done, right? So let's say, you know, you took a break for a couple of days, you sit down with MP1, rerun the test suite when you sit down. It's frequently the first thing I do when I sit down to work on a project, right? Don't write any new code, just rerun the test suite to make sure that it's still working. All right, I'm back. I had to attend to the oven for a minute. Um, so my test suite's still running, and you'll see that there are five tests in my test suite. One of them is ignore. That was the helper test that I provided to you, and so I've, I've uncommented that ignore annotation. It's not running. That's this one. You'll see that it's marked with this cross out. Three of them are succeeding. Now, I've got this turned on. I would suggest that you do that as well. If you click this, you'll see tests that succeed. I like to see the tests that are succeeding because it reminds me of the fact that I've done hard work on a project. When I run a test suite, you know, the test suite for some of our uh, components for this class has hundreds and hundreds of tests. Those tests represent like years and years and years of person work on the project. And so I like to see all of them still passing. It just reminds me of like, wow, I've done a lot of work on this. Sometimes programmers have a tendency to be really negative. Um, and so like seeing an embodiment of all the hard work that you've already done is sort of cool. So I usually leave that on. Um, now there are three tests that are passing. I expected that because I've completed the first three tests as part of the project. I'm, I'm working along with you. There's one that's failing. And the one that's failing is the last one to work on. It's called test restaurant search function. And going forward, I'm only going to run that test. The whole suite takes too long to run and I wanna be able to go back and forth between my code and the tests more fluidly. And so I'm just gonna run this one test. And so I'm gonna go right here. I'm gonna find that test. It's in the integration test component. And I'm just gonna click on run test restaurant search function. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip back and forth between running this test, understanding what failed, and then going back to the code that I'm supposed to be working on and making changes. And you do this until the test passes. And then, like I said, it's good to run the whole suite again, make sure that everything is working and you didn't break anything else. Um, okay, so when I run this, it's going to fail. And when it fails, there's one really important piece of data that's buried in this big blob of output, right? And, you know, I mean, some of you have pointed out like, oh, when I use the homework grader, the output is really useful. And it is really useful because I wrote it to be useful. But now you're interacting with more, you know, real world systems. And sometimes the output is, uh, I would say it's usually useful, but it, you gotta have, there's a skill to finding the piece of information that you need in the output quickly. In this case, the one piece of information that I want, the highest order bit is where did the test suite fail? Because if I know where the test suite failed, it should give me some information about what went wrong. And so if I scroll down here, you'll see that there's one thing here that's sort of hyperlinked. That's a line in empty test.kt and that's what I wanna click on. Okay, so what this means is that this is the line in the test suite that failed. So what the test suites do is they run uh, they basically run tests on your code that in this case, because we're doing integration tests, mimic how a user might use your app. 
and they make sure that certain things happen in a certain way. And if you, in, in normal development, you write the tests and then you also write the code. And so you have a pretty good idea of what the tests do. In this case, I wrote the tests and you're writing the code. And so I've written information in the test suites designed to be helpful as you go along because I don't really fully understand, expect you to understand all the code in the test suites, but I do hope the comments are helpful, okay? And so what happened up till this point in the test? So you'll see that on line 232, I performed a search that returned, that I expected not to return any results. Sadly, as far as the list that I created of all the restaurants that I use this online tool to produce, there are no Ethiopian restaurants in Champaign-Urbana. Too bad. Um, but when I, so when I search for this, in the UI of your app, I expect the list to be blank. Uh, and when I got down, there's some pauses in here, which we add just to allow your app to catch up and make sure the UI is done rendering. And then I'm checking that this says count recycler view is zero. And essentially that's counting the number of items that are shown in your list. And I expect that to be zero. Now, if you ran the app right now and typed in Ethiopian, you would still see all the restaurants. And the reason is that we're not responding to those inputs at all, okay? Now I'm going to go back to my code and I would be start working on on query text change. Now there's a couple of things that you'll need to do as you start working on this. So the first thing is understand a little bit about this uh, list component because you're going to have to manipulate the contents. The list adapter is stored as a field on the object. And one thing you could, there's two ways to do this, right? Well, there's lots of ways you could try to read the documentation. There is some online documentation for this. Uh, you could also just look at what's happening here. So when this is when the list is initially populated. So when I get the initial list of restaurants from my backend server, I call listadapter.edit.replaceAll. I pass it a list of restaurants and then commit. And changes to the contents of the list adapter do have to be wrapped with this edit call and then a commit call. So when you start, you have to hit edit. That sort of opens the list so that you can modify it. When you're done, you have to hit commit. And then there's this replace all method that kind of does what it sounds like. It replaces the entire contents of the list with whatever new list of restaurants you pass. And to be honest, that should be enough to get you through on query text change. Think about what you need here. You need a query string. We already wrote a search method. You guys did that as part of an earlier test. So you have that ready to go. Um, what you need is you need to run that and you need to make sure that the list gets updated properly. Now there's one little wrinkle here, which is that in order to run that method, you need a list of restaurants. But the list of restaurants that's retrieved from the client right here is not saved anywhere. And so you may need to make a change to your main activity code to make sure that you always have a copy of that list, right? So this list right now is only a local variable inside on create. You may need to move it or hoist it outside of OnCreate so that it's available to other methods. So for example, there's no restaurants list here uh, that I can use, right? I don't, don't, you don't want to call load restaurants. I want a copy of the restaurants list that, that should, uh, that was passed here, right? So I just need to make sure I save a reference to that um, inside this, this method, right? So there are, there's a few small changes you need to make here. But overall, the code that you write for onQuery text change should be four or five lines of code. It's really uh, not a huge amount to write. If you find yourself doing a lot more work than that, please ask for help, come to the help site, you know, post on the forum, whatever, uh, and, and, and we'll be there for you and we'll help, help talk you through it, right? But you know, this is one of those things that like, we've already done all the hard work, right? We wrote the search method. That was much more difficult conceptually than the code that we have to create here. All we need to do is make some minor changes to main activity so that I have a copy of the restaurants list. Then I need to use the search method that I've already written to get a new restaurants list and update the UI appropriately. You do those couple of things, you'll pass this test case without a problem. Now, as you're working, you know, when you write some code, go back, rerun the test. The more often you run these tests, the more likely it is that you're gonna make good progress. Don't try to write the whole thing and then run the tests. I mean, in this case, you probably could because it's pretty small. But when you're writing more complex methods, you know, run the tests as often as possible. Even if you don't expect the tests to succeed, it can be helpful to know what's failing, 
right? So for example, this query should return zero results. If you come down here and you find that some of these queries aren't working, eh, there might be something interesting going on, right? Most of these should work because you've already written the search function and we already tested that separately. But you know, understanding what's failing about the test suite can be really important. Okay, if, if you apply this, this approach, run the test, write some code, run the test, write some code, run the test, understand what failed, understand why your code isn't meeting the requirement, update your code to try to do a little bit better. If you just proceed in this way, it's kind of ratcheting forward one piece by piece, you will fly through MP1, MP2, MP3, and out into a world of software creation where you'll be very successful. Right? Uh, this, is the, this is the way that you know, those of us who do this for a living go about this process. Right? We work in small increments and we drive things by test cases and understanding uh, what goes wrong. So good luck with this uh, checkpoint. You're almost done uh, with MP1.